talk is like very nice. Like I have the ability to shorten my talk nicely to fit the amount of time we actually have. I might need to turn it'll, actually, it'll still be nice and coherent. <laughs> I would just introduce in behalf of um, Roy. Um, Roy is not here. Uh, hi, yeah, hi. So uh, my name is Gene. I'm, I'm in logic program, uh, but I'm not normally in charge of this. Uh, Roy was the is the organizer for this semester. So I guess we have. Where to, is he? He's um, I don't know somewhere <laughs> uh, over the rainbow. Um, <laughs> we, are, we have we have MD today to talk about compactness and compactification. Uh, let's start. Is it recording? It's recording. Uh, I'll be in it. I think so. Okay. Um, sorry about the food. Um, we ordered at five. All right. So, all right. Thanks for letting me speak first. I enjoy any opportunity I can get to bombard people with interesting points of topology. Uh, so today we're going to talk about compactness. If I can find the chalk. Here's a chalk. And there's a chalk. Okay, that should be good. So um, I'm going to assume some point set topology, um, but just some blanket caveats. Everything today is going to be Hausdorff. Let's just remember what that means. If I give you two points, I can separate them by open sets that are also disjoint. Um, so that's the setting in which life is going to happen today. But we're interested not just in Hausdorff spaces, we're interested in compact spaces. So let's remember, um, so x is compact. the same thing as every open cover. Admits a finite subcover. An open cover is just some collection of open sets that covers the whole space. And then finite subcover that is hopefully clear. Um, there's a lot of other things I could write down um, that are equivalent. Often, what's really useful to work with is this definition. Every net in X has a convergent subnet. What's a net? Um, generalizes a sequence. I won't be using nets too heavily today, but... Uh, just there, there is a sequence-like definition of compactness that does generalize to um, arbitrary spaces. And why do we like compactness? Compactness is really nice. It's much easier to work with. Um, it's if we have a space that's not compact, we would often like to stick it inside some compact space that we can use the techniques that compact spaces allow us to use. Um, let's remember a few facts about what, what are the nice things about compact spaces that we want to use. Actually, maybe let me, let me start off with some like prototypical examples. Uh, the unit interval. Nice compact space. Um, I can look at any finite set with a discrete topology. Um, and <laughs> the other main thing we're going to do is. If I have a lot of compact spaces, I can take arbitrary products, that's Tignock's theorem. So in particular, 
what we're really going to be focusing on a lot today is taking the unit interval and raising it to some power. So here i is just some set. Index set. And i could be huge. i could be ridiculously huge. But we're still going to get a nice compact space. Um, Remember that the product topology of nice space is given by, you can specify an open set on finitely many coordinates, and then you just have to take the whole thing. Um, and then, so if I have compact space, I can make products. And then the other sort of prototypical example we're going to work with is um, closed subspaces. surprising is that the interval 0, 1, the ability to take arbitrary products, and the ability to take closed subspaces, this is actually entirely general. We get every compact space that we could ever want out of this. And before I get into that, one more nice property. Um, every, so a nice called a nice thing. Nice thing. Compact house door spaces. Though I don't have to specify house door because life is house door today. <coughs> spaces are normal. So let's remember what normal is by picture. Here's a space. Here is a closed, so here's a space X. Here's a closed subspace A. Here's another closed subspace B. A and B are disjoint. And then what normality allows me to do is I can stick A inside an open set U. I can stick B inside an open set V and u and v are disjoint. And this is actually incredibly useful. This is really the driving engine between, like, this is how you prove, like, Burisome's metrization theorem. This is how you prove um, Burisome's lemma. Um, Burisome was kind of an important person. But the nice... <laughs> um, um, but yeah, if you look at the picture, Normality is just kind of a, um, a more powerful version of Hausdorff. It's what's known as a separation axiom. Sometimes it's called T4. Um, today we're going to actually talk a lot about not T4, but what's called T3 and a half. And to motivate that, I need to sort of tell you what the talk is about. Because we haven't mentioned the second word, compactification. So, let Y be any space, house door space, life is house door, a compactification of Y is going to have two parts. We have a compact space X. And we have an embedding F, I'll call it, from Y into X so that the image is dense. I'm just going to write with f of y closure equal to the whole thing. So in particular, a few things to note. Um, 
we could really think of, it's helpful to just think of y as being a subset of x by some shifty relabeling you can actually do that. Um, and also if I omit this condition, I can just take the closure of the image and then obtain a compactification. Because closed, we have this nice property, closed subspaces and compact spaces are compact. So the question we're attacking today is what spaces admit compactification? So I'll just coin this buzzword, a space X is compactifiable. If X admits a compactification. So what's a nice, let's think about what properties compactifiable spaces have to have from, what can we learn about it from the compactification? Well, compact spaces have normality, so that's going to immediately tell us from normality <coughs> completely regular. I'm going to define this. Completely regular. So, to both define and justify why we get complete regularity, we need to remember that normal spaces, there's actually a stronger property that's equivalent to normality. Not only can I separate A and B by open sets in a normal space, I can do so by a function. So let's remember what that means. There's some continuous function on X that's going to send A to the value 0 and B to the value 1. Not necessarily, I'm not requiring that A is the pre-image of 0 or that B is the pre-image of 1, but just that A is cont contained in the pre-image of 0. And that's certainly strong enough to imply normality as I've defined it here. Um, the equivalence, the, the hard bit, is Uri Sohn's lemma, which, as we've heard, Uri Sohn was an important guy. Uh, so, when I take a compactification of X, I, let's say that I have a point. Let me draw a picture. So here's x. And here is the compactification. Um, actually, uh, yeah, I'll call it compactification. <coughs> Let's say that I have a point in x and a, let's call it point p, and I also have a closed, let me actually draw this a little bit more suggestively, a closed A, a subset of X. A is closed in X, but A is not necessarily closed over an X prime. So this is why compactifiable spaces are not necessarily normal. Because if I have disjoint closed sets and then I take their closure and the compactification, they might suddenly meet somewhere. But since I require P to be a point, we're going to be okay. The closure of A, maybe A prime, A prime might have some points over here, but A prime and P are still going to be disjoint. So what we've done is we can separate, or what we can do, I should say. I can separate A prime and P by a function. 
because I can do it over here. And this is exactly the property that is complete regularity. So let me write that down. Um, <coughs> the space is completely regular. If any point and closed subspace not containing the point, maybe I'll just say avoiding the point. can be separated by a function. So not just by open sets, but actually by a function. In the regular setting, those are not the same. Arisone's lemma doesn't generalize to regular spaces. Point can be separated by a function. All right, so what have we done so far? We have isolated a property that any space that admits a compactification must have. Any space that is compactifiable must be completely <coughs> regular. What is actually, again, kind of surprising and not terribly hard is that that's actually all that we need to require. Before I erase this, let's remember this guy right here. We're going to be taking product of unit intervals a lot in this proof. to take the Gelfand transform of X. And so I'm just going to put that in parentheses here, Gelfand transform. So I'm going to let C of X, this is not quite the traditional notation, but it's what I'm going to use. C of X denote continuous zero one value functions. So I mean any continuous function would be bounded, but I really want to fix the bounds of zero and one. It's just going to make life easier. Form. So this is this is a box space. It has lots of topologies, but I actually don't care about any of that. I'm going to regard this as just a really big set. And what did I say we can do with really big sets? We can put them in the exponent of zero one and obtain a nice compact space. So I'm going to form the space zero one to the C of X. This is just a nice, it's, it's a very large space, but it's compact, because it's just a product of 0, 1 by a lot of copies. So I claim that compactification is going to be a closed subspace, because what do we need to do? We need to cook up a compactification of x. I guess I should have said x is 
Suppose x is compactifiable. We're going to uh, construct a compactification. You mean suppose x is completely regular? Hmm? Suppose x is completely regular. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's the direction we're going. x is completely regular. The compactification is going to be a closed subspace of this guy. So that what's just, the map? That would be just the space of measures. Hmm? The, your, the, the product is just the space of measures there. Well, these aren't necessarily measures. They're just they're just zero one value. Fun this is What's um, functional. Um, they're not. There's not linear necessarily. Okay. X X doesn't necessarily have a linear structure on it. They're just just all the continuous functions. They're they're bounded between zero. And one. <laughs> so define. The map <coughs> by, and this map is actually, once you write down this map, it's really the <coughs> only choice of map. It's really cool. So, what is phi of some little x going to be? This is going to be. So the typical coordinate in this large product is some continuous function f. The value I'm going to put at that coordinate is nothing more than f of x. This is like the double tool. Yes, it's, it's a very similar construction. And this is as f ranges over c of x. So, phi may not have dense image, but we're just going to take the closure of the image as our <coughs> proposed compactification. So we need to prove, what do we need to prove? We need to prove that phi is an embedding. What I hope is clear immediately, um, phi is definitely continuous. And it's definitely injective. So the only tricky bit is showing that um, the images of closed sets are relatively closed in the image. So to say that precisely, what I need to do, we need to show going to assume, let's just set fp of a to always be 0. So then the point gets value 1, a always <coughs> gets 0. So what's w going to be? w is just going to be 
those functions functions from c of x to 0, zero 1. What do I want to demand? I'm going to demand that for every p in x, that r of f sub p, that's not very legible, that at coordinate f sub p, we take value 0. And then it's, it's immediate that we've done what we set out to do. Because, say that W certainly, we want to argue that this is the same as this. <clears throat> this certainly contains V of A. If there were some other point, that can't happen because we separated it. At that point, r of f of p would be 1, and that's not going to happen. Wait, so w doesn't depend on a at all? Oh, no, w depends. Remember, we chose, we chose oh. these functions. Okay. So that's going to depend, say, what coordinates we want to be 0. <coughs> so that's actually, so this is our first characterization of compactifiable spaces. And with almost enough time to actually attempt to do this, but probably not quite enough, I'm going to attempt the second characterization. Because what's, um, what is sort of lacking in this proof is... Wait, Karen, can I just ask, what is the Gelfand transform? Which of these things is it? Ah. Is it like... I think it's I think it's forming <laughs> this space. Okay, never mind. I was just okay, sure. Okay. I'm not entirely sure. I, I believe it's the step of forming this space okay. and perhaps this map also. Gelfand Gelfand was heavily involved in this proof. Is it? So, <laughs> <laughs> you transform it from something different. No, I mean he was like th these sort of ideas are what go into the Gelfand Nymark theorem. So, um, if you're familiar with those things. So, what is, um, what's deficient about this proof? Or what, what else could we hope to understand? Given a completely regular space X, this proof constructs the same compactification. This is actually the beta compactification of X. It's the largest most general compactification of X. But say that I ask the question, given a compactifiable space, what compactifications can I form? This proof is not going to help us out. This spits out the same space every time. So it would be awesome if we could figure out some internal characterization of what compactifications of x look like. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do in 25 minutes. So I'm just going to warn you now, my uh, proofs might start getting pretty hand wavy just due to the time constraint. But what we're going to do is take a brief diversion <coughs> into the topic of uniform spaces. And I'm going to define this completely generally for now. So, X is just a set. I have not topologized it or anything. But I'm going to tell you what it means to put a uniformity on, I'm going to call my uniformity U on X, is U is a collection of subsets 
of x cross x. So think of this as the way to intuit this definition is to pretend that x actually is a topological space. Here's x, here's x, here's the diagonal, and u is going to look like things around the diagonal. And that's this picture is going to be made formal by the next few bullets. So you have to satisfy the intersection over u in u of all u is actually equal to delta, which is, I guess I should tell you that this is my notation for the diagonal. I am being more strict than the most general. I, I lied. I said I was being entirely general, but I'm, since life is Hausdorff today, I cooked this up in a way that's going to give us Hausdorff things later on. Normally, it's just this intersection would contain the diagonal, but I'm actually demanding equality. Uh, and then we, we want uh, fancy U to be closed under some nice uh, closure properties. <coughs> so I might just say this really quickly and say U is a filter. A quick reminder of what that is, that means it's closed under finite intersections and taking supersets. So it's a notion, intuitively, script U is a notion of neighborhood of the diagonal, or contains a neighborhood of the diagonal. So we, we should demand that it be closed under finite intersections and superset. Three is that if I have something in script U, then U inverse is in script U, where U inverse is just all the pairs of points where I flipped the coordinates <coughs> from members of U. one is the trickiest but most important. And what 4 corresponds to is a kind of very weak version of the triangle inequality. So I'm going to write it as follows. Given some u and u. So in, I'll just maybe to preview this, in the language of metric spaces, this says we can divide distance by 2. There is, so given some guy in script u, I'm going to find a smaller guy in script u. How much smaller with v to the power of 2 in the subset of U, where I have to explain this notation because it's actually horribly abusive. I do not mean V cross V, I mean V to the power of 2 are pairs, so that there is another point in the set. So that, so if I said this is like the triangle inequality, we're forming a triangle. Here's x, here's y. I'm saying this is roughly a distance u. I'm saying that there is some quote unquote distance v and a point z so that 
this guy and this guy are at distance B. So V squared are those points so that there is a Z in X with <coughs> X Z in V and uh, Z Y. So if you think about these as if you think about these subsets of the product as relations on the set, then this is just a composite of V with itself. Yes, yes. Okay. That makes that's, sense. That's exactly what we're doing. Is there any value in thinking of it that way? Um not especially. I mean, because you only need like in practice you only need to dive down to things like because like I mean this is inductive, I can replace two with n. And this axiom four will still hold. You, in practice, you only need to go down to like four or so, and you'll prove anything you want to prove. Um, so I've kept mentioning that we want to think of this like we should have the intuition that X is actually a space and not just a set, and we're going to justify that intuition by cooking up a topology from a uniformity. So, topology from uniformity <coughs> So, we're going to say I'll just kind of be informal tau of the uniformity This is going to be the topology where the typical neighborhood of a point X and X is the set that's you, which is going to be Notion of neighborhood, you can recover a suitable notion of open neighborhood if you uh, want to just work with open neighborhoods. And often, from now on, I'm going to be thinking topology first, uniformity second. So we can simplify our discussion a lot by always working with members of script U that are open and symmetric. And so often I'm going to make those assumptions implicitly. Um, before I go on, let's just get some examples out there. So uniformities, or I'll say uniform spaces in nature. So exa prototypical example, metric spaces. Your typical uniformity are all points that are no further apart than epsilon. Or I guess I should say who are less than epsilon apart if we want open. Uh, here's kind of a fun example, um, which I like, but I'm well, we'll go for it anyway. Any topological group has a very natural choice of uniform structure. Where I can say your typical uniformity is going to look something like GH. So 
so that GH inverse is in V, where V ranges over neighborhoods of the identity. We have a lot of analysis people in here. So anytime you define a, um, I'll just say like um, norm spaces, uh, countably norm spaces, or actually I mean um, spaces whose topology are generated by any collection of norms. I'll just say spaces generated by norms. Or even more generally, I can replace norm with just pseudometric. So all of the topological vector spaces you work with in functional analysis have very nice uh, uniformities, either from two or from three. There's, a, there's an equivalent. Um, And I guess what we're going to do is, I'll write this definition here, the space x is uniformizable. <coughs> so x is the topological space, it's uniformizable if the topology is the same one induced from some uniform. Uh, induced by some uniformity. So why why did I take this ten minute diversion into defining what uniform spaces are? So one of the key observations is that compact spaces are uniformizable. So let's try to prove that real fast. subset of x squared v contains an open neighborhood of x is diagonal. And you have to check that this actually works, and notably for 4 you have to use compactness to make it fly, um, but you can do it. And a nice remark, which is also suggestive, is that U, as above, is the unique uniformity. And so this is kind of suggestive, because what it's saying is that somehow compact spaces do not have a lot of choice, they have no choice in what uniformity you have to 
take to generate that topology. And so this suggests that if you have a space that is merely compactifiable, that maybe studying uniformities on it is a good way to study compactification. And that's exactly what we're going to do, except for the fact that we only have seven minutes left. Um, I should remark that, and I've used it implicitly, subspaces of uniform spaces are uniformizable, just by, you can take uh, the subspace uniformity. And so then, compactifiable spaces, by this result, are uniformizable. But, you can imagine that if you have different compactifications of a space, the uniform structure you get induced is going to look different depending on what um, compactification you started with. And while you would hope that the correspondence is exact, it's not quite right. There are more uniforms, there are more uniformities than there are compactifications. But the good news is that every compactification is described by uniformity. And I don't have enough time to... I, what I was hoping to do was to actually build this map going back and forth between uniformities and compact um, compactifications. But I'll just mumble something about it. So here's the thought. Given x u a uniform space, construct a compact space. information, I'll just put this in quotes, and so what the information is, is the construction runs via these things called near ultra filters, you define those based on your uniform space, you get a nice compact house store space out of it. It's going to compactify uh, your uniform space. But I don't have time to run through that, so I think I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Any questions? What? This is a question that doesn't relate to anything you said recently, but it intrigued me because you said it earlier. Uh, you say you can construct any compact house store, compact house store space from taking arbitrary products and closed subspaces of the unit interval. Yes. How hard is that to prove? We, we did it. We mm -hmm. proved it. Did we they? take the Gelfand transform of a compact space. And then take a subspace. Oh. Yeah. And if the space because you're taking the beta compactification of a compact so space, so it's the just the same space. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's sexy. Isn't it slick? <laughs> nice. That makes me tingle. <laughs> does, does this last bit still work in non house door spaces? Non house door spaces? I'm thinking <laughs> algebraic varieties. Um, I don't think compact spaces in the non house door setting are necessarily uniformizable. Because, I mean, the, the whole contradiction that you, that you get over here is you obtain a point. Because um, say that the way that this proof roughly runs is say that you have a failure of condition 4 in hoping that this is a uniform space. You use compactness to find a nice subnet of a suitable, suitably chosen net. You obtain a point supposedly you, a, a, a pair of points. It's a, it's a point in x cross x. Supposedly in every 
element of your uniformity, but not on the diagonal. And that's the whole source of your contradiction. So that contradiction goes out the window when you're not Hausdorff. So, I actually, I, I know embarrassingly little about what happens in the non-Hausdorff setting. I have to ask a category theoretical question. Okay. Do uniform uniform spaces form a category? Other morphisms like what? What's oh yeah, the uniform continuity. Okay, so okay, and or I guess I uniformly so continuous dis maps. Distinct compact spaces give rise to distinct uniform spaces, and vice yes. versa, right? So there's one in um, distinct uniform spaces give you distinct compact spaces when you do this. Oh, uh, so that's what I was trying to hint at, but not quite. Um, compact spaces give you distinct uniformities. Yes. There are different uniformities that can give rise to the same compact space. I'll, I'll mumble a little bit more about this, because it's actually not hard to say. <clears throat> Any uniform space gives rise to a notion of a proximal space, where what you do is you say that A is proximal to B if for every set in your uniformity I blow A up by V. So think if your uniformity is a metric space, what you're doing is you're taking A and you're blowing it up by epsilon, and B you're blowing up by epsilon. So I'm demanding for every epsilon that this be non-empty. And what matters in constructing the compactification is this proximality relation. And there actually there is a notion of proximal space and proximal continuity, and that is, I guess it would have to be the same as the as C house. Cool. Um, so I think my line of inquiry was like, if this is not going to function, this happening again, do you think? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Um, because you can you go from uniform to proximal. Yeah. Proximal is, I think, by this discussion, naturally isomorphic to C house. Okay. Um, and C house. Yes, I think. I I just I smell. There, 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 I don't I don't know the right. I smell the left side going happen. Yeah, there's there's probably an injunction. Okay. I'll stop questions. I'll stop asking. Uh, yes. Do you have any relationships on how nice the information can need to be for the space to be metrizable? Ew, so um, countably generated. Right, because if the diagonal is is G delta, then you can't metrization. Mm -hmm. So that's six countably generated. Yeah, so it, it's, it's if and only if you have a countably generated uniformity. Okay. And then I guess this is a nice, um, a general remark is that um, given any uniformity, any uniformity is, uh, any uniform space is, has a topology generated by pseudometrics, exactly because of that observation. Um, and, s and that's sort of a, that's a nice alternate characterization of what a uniform space is. It's any space whose topology is generated by pseudometrics. And really what is, your prototypical pseudometric is just some function to the reals. You do assume compactness, right? Hmm? Compa you, as you assume compactness, though. The compact plus countably generated uniformizable metrizable. Uh, no, no. Just any, any uniform space. Any uniform space. Any uniform space with G delta diagonal uniformizable. Or metrizable. Yeah.